Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Julia Levine. I am the Knowledge Mobilization Specialist at Research Impact Canada. Um, today, I'm pleased to introduce to you um, Cheryl Jensen, who will be speaking on our webinar on future-proofing research skills, current perspectives in a changing world. So as I mentioned, Cheryl um, today is, is speaking to us. She's the interim principal at Russia University College, which is an affiliate of Western University. And as part of a funding opportunity that we had from the Future Skills Centre and Research Impact Canada, Cheryl was brought on by McMaster University to investigate and articulate, articulate the place of future skills in research intensive universities. Cheryl wrote a report with recommendations for McMaster, and these findings were used to establish an institutional plan to provide the tools and knowledge to deliver an education to graduates that will help them be successful throughout their career lifestyle, life cycles. Um, this research, as I mentioned, was funded by the Conference Board of Canada through the Government of Canada's Future Skills Centre. And a version of this report has already been published in English and French on the Research Impact website. And I'll share the links to these reports in the chat box today. Um, as I said, we're pleased to have Cheryl. We're, today's session is being recorded and um, in the upcoming few days will be posted on the RIC website. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to um, put them in the chat box. I'll be moderating the conversation. And as soon as Cheryl is done talking, you can raise your hand, unmute yourself and feel free to speak. So thank you again, Cheryl, and I'll turn the mic over to you. Well, thanks, Julia. And it's, uh, it's an honor to be here with everyone today. Um, Julia asked that I do a land acknowledgement. And so I'm at Brescia, but I'm actually at home, which is just south of Hamilton, Ontario, um, which is close to Six Nations. I chose, though, to use the acknowledgement that we use at Brescia. Um, for the opening of our board meetings and our council meetings. We acknowledge that our campus at Brescia University College is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Attawandurun peoples, all of whom have long-standing relationships to the land of southwestern Ontario and the contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle, Turtle Island also known as North America. Well, thanks for having me here. It's an honor, as I said, and this report was written about a year ago, almost to the date before everything shut down. But I do think it's relevant and maybe even more relevant as we have navigated our way through this year of the pandemic. You know, the issue of what skills are needed for individuals to succeed in the rapidly changing world of work has received a lot of attention, arguably worldwide, but certainly in Canada over the last five years. The efforts to work with employers and students to demonstrate that university graduates at both the undergraduate and graduate level have the skills to succeed have been successful, especially in the fields of undergraduate science, technology, engineering, and math. The work done in the fields of arts and humanities and graduate research where the focus, at least in, in the past, has been to prepare uh, professors for university research and teaching, has been more difficult to quantify and to dispel any negative perceptions of job availability and success. So how do we move forward to capitalize on the strengths of research intensive universities? Governments and their mandates change, we all know that, However, there's been a lot of discussion about the essential skills needed for graduates to succeed and for employers and their work to thrive over the same five years or so. And this is a challenge for all universities, but certainly for the U15, as we call them in Canada, the heavy research intense universities. So why me? <laughs> I might ask the same question. I'm not going to go through all of my history, and you may have read my bio, but I will say that my career began in private and heavy industry before I moved into post-secondary education after I graduated from McMaster. 
I spent 16 years teaching in the Faculty of Engineering Technology at Mohawk College before moving into about 20 years of administrative roles, all the way from a chair, uh, ultimately to vice president academic. Then I moved to Ottawa as president of Algonquin College. And you know, my entire career has been focused on learner success, learner satisfaction and community and economic development. And the latter, the economic development required very strong partnerships between business, industry, all three levels of government, as well as other post-secondary institutions. You can't do this alone. So I've approached this paper, keeping front of mind the views that associations and industry uh, told me on what they expect of post-secondary grads and their needs for the future. I was also mindful about how this work might inform other phases of this project. The responsibility to learners both now and in the future is central, was central to my report. I didn't do this on my own. I've interviewed leaders in academia, business and industry and developed some recommendations from that. I'm fortunate enough right now, as Julia said, to be currently the interim principal at Russia University College. And it's given me some time to get to know partnerships and the potential of increased partnerships in London with the three affiliates of Western, a large research intensive university, but also with the city, with social agencies, with business, industry, and of course, a great college in London, in London Fanshawe College. So first of all, I, I took a look at the challenge in, um, in, this, in this field. And as I say, man maintaining a hard earned status as a research intensive university is extremely important. Uh, it's important to the university, but it's also important to society. And universities in general have a distinctive mission that may seem, at least at the time, incongruent to the focus on career readiness and employment, out, um, employment outcomes. You probably know the U15, the top research universities in Canada, and the appropriate balance of this mandate and the employability of graduates in an environment demanding flexibility, agility, and rad, rapid adaptation is challenging to achieve. Challenging, but in my opinion, extremely vital. And all universities face this, large and small. At Russia, we have these same conversations as we build our signature programs in foods and nutrition, as well as an impressive suite of liberal arts offerings, as well as a signature Russia Bold experience that I think is pretty awesome. And that's seven competencies that match the essential skills that employers are demanding. And you can certainly see those essential skills in the Conference Board of Canada reports. We also know that Ontario's public post-secondary institutions receive funding assistance from the provincial government. The current government is planning to tie a significant amount of funding to performance outcomes. 25% of funding starting in 2021 and increasing in stages up to about 60% in 24-25. And these outcomes will be a subset of 10 measures currently in the strategic mandate agreements that each institution has in place and has had to sign and submit to the government. And while there's still some uncertainty around the outcomes and certainly the timelines, especially during the pandemic, it's likely that change will happen and that graduate employment and perhaps employer and graduate satisfaction could be outcomes by which funding will be allocated, a very different approach certainly to the university sector. So the discussion was really what skills are needed to succeed in the rapidly, a rapidly changing world of work and this issue with arts and humanities, what to do about um, a program area that to me is vital and needs to be nurtured, but is certainly seeing quite dramatic declines in enrollment all across Canada. 
So I, as, as Julia said, I developed four recommendations for what I think are opportunities and potentially actions for research intensive universities in Ontario, um, but certainly in my research can happen all across Canada. So my first recommendation is that uh, community advisory panels should be um, developed for every school or every faculty in a university. And these advisory panels should be consisted of employers, students, graduates, professors, and administration. So all of those partners in these advisory panels are incre incredibly important. And this panel should meet often enough to discuss and advise on the changing world of work in that program cluster the needs for every stakeholder group and the strategies to move forward in an open and transparent manner. To me, this initiative will bring all groups together to discuss challenges and opportunities in meeting the needs of the future skills. So I was uh, fortunate enough to be a member of the Business Higher Education Roundtable and this roundtable was really convened by um, the Royal Bank um, David Mackay, who's the uh, CEO, uh, was a major uh, player in getting this uh, roundtable set up. And a major report was written based on the RBC National Survey of Employers, Employers and Students and Government that was call that's called Humans Wanted, How Canadian Youth Can Thrive in the Age of Disruption. And I don't think anything has been more disruptive to all of us than the pandemic. And in the introduction, President Mackay stated this, as employers, we need to rethink the way we hire, retrain and continuously reshape our workforces. As educators, that's us, we need to think beyond degrees and certificates. And as governments, we need to take advantage of the world of instant information to harness the coming skills revolution and young Canadians everywhere need to seize the moment. Again, that can't be done on its own and that's why I think these, um, these panels are so important. My second recommendation, institution-wide strategies to become cooperative education and work integrated learning environments. Well, this is pretty easy to say very challenging uh, for, for universities and post-secondary to envision and to implement, especially if it's not currently in the culture of the, of the university. Some may say it's impossible to do this during a pandemic and perhaps during the aftermath of the pandemic, but I know of institutions right now who are adapting to this and succeeding with um, work integrated learning during a very uh, challenging time. I have personal experience at both of my former institutions in focusing on a cooperative education strategy. Some may say that this is a model of education that is better aligned with colleges and polytechnics, but I believe it's important to listen to those we serve, all of us, students and employers in all post-secondary institutions. And my discussions with CEOs of business and industry while putting together this report and my readings showed that both business and industry leaders and students are clear on their requirements and requests for work experience. I would suggest that these lasting common interest partnerships that I talk about in recommendation two could lead to companies hiring more co-op students that they need, than they need to assist the university in placements and to accepting the challenge to hire liberal arts students to solve complex problems as part of a team. Students, recent and after graduating, are clear on their views. A not so long ago report in the Toronto Star published on Feb in February of 2020 discussed how four Toronto area students are preparing themselves for future work and what schools can do to prepare them for the jobs of the future. More experiential learning was a common thread. The students interviewed in Humans Wanted, referenced earlier in this, uh, in this presentation, gave the same feedback 
And while I sat on the Business Higher Education Roundtable, David Mackay put forward a challenge to the group. This one is a big challenge. He said that 100% of Canadian students should have a co-op experience, a very lofty goal. And when challenged, Mr. Mackay would respond that any less than 100% would leave talent on the table. And you know, RBC leads by example and hires students or interns every year to solve issues and problems at the bank, big issues at the bank. And that's led to new patent registrations for, for the company. So those are students, interns, co-op students that are developing patents. And I'm sure you know of many more examples of that. My third recommendation is to expand interdisciplinary undergraduate and graduate programs to give skills gained through the liberal arts. And what I mean by this is really that the best of liberal arts and the best of professional programs, technical programs, health programs need to be integrated in order to provide our graduates with the skills that they need to be successful. This means starting to break down the silos and barriers that we all know exist in post-secondary education. And so that we start working together on, um, on new types of programming. You may know Paul Davidson, CEO of Universities Canada. He and I were chatting as I was uh, putting together this work. And he indicated to me that there's already considerable work being done to mediate, um, to mediate this, um, this type of work. And you know, I can think of a couple of examples. Uh, if I can mention Brescia again, I'm just very proud of Brescia, this Brescia Bold program. If you can imagine uh, every university having a, a, a program where every student had integrated into their program the essential skills that are needed in the workforce, that would be, um, that would be such a, um, a monumental um, accomplishment. And we know that liberal arts and humanities enrollment is declining and lots of studies have been given on that. But I love this study. It's one by Sandra Lapointe, Associate Professor of, Professor of Philosophy at McMaster, uh, who's also the project director for the collaborative, which is uh, an in initiative that fosters better collaborative culture around social sciences and humanities, education and impact. And she co-authored with uh, Dr. Jonathan Turner from the University of Toronto, the report, Leveraging the Skills of Social Sciences and Humanities Graduates. And that was for the Future Skills Center at Ryerson. So I'm sure you can find that, um, that published. But the author stated that there's still work to be done on this that I think relates to my recommendation here. And those are how universities are responding to growing demands to improve employability of graduates in social sciences and humanities more comprehensive mapping of programs that exist, their goals and the structure and how they link to employer needs, the processes they use and the tools available to measure quality and effectiveness, and the ways that skill acquisition is documented or credentialed. I just uh, read just the other day about Western. Um, Western has acquired some funding, some a donation actually, and some, and some funding to offer a, an apprenticeship to their social sciences students. And that's the kind of innovative thinking that we need, we need here. But the impact of these programs, including who participates, who benefits, and whether they result in improved out, uh, employment outcomes, I think still needs to be studied. And certainly the particular impact of these programs on the equity seeking groups, including low income people, racialized individuals, indigenous people, persons with disabilities, women, and the LGBTQ2S plus, plus people. And those are all groups that we know have been heavily impacted by the, um, by the pandemic. So this requires partnerships, collaboration, and networks, which are the words that I've been using throughout my entire career. I do want to mention here before um, before I move on a study that um, um, really resonated with me, um, and you may have heard of it. It's, it's a study that came from the University of Toronto. It's called the Ten Thousand PhDs Project, 
and I mention it now because a lot of what I said, I've said could be applied to any university. I focused on the research intensive universities in, in uh, my report. And the 10,000 PhDs project was completed under the direction and supervision of uh, Dr. Reichmeyer. He's a professor of biochemistry and was the uh, Toronto, University of Toronto chair and special advisor to the Dean in 2015 to 2017. And this project uh, was set up to determine the 2016 employment status of 10,000 individuals, 10,000 plus individuals, who graduated from the University of Toronto with a PhD in all disciplines from 2000 to 2015. Interestingly, the study was conducted by a team of trained senior undergrad and grad students using internet searches. And the researchers were um, interested in determining where grad students found employment after graduation. And that's, um, that was interesting to me because I think um, often we think about where PhD students go after they graduate. Do they end up in academia or do they find other careers? And so the abstract, and I'll just read a little bit from the abstract rather than going through the whole project. We found that half, 51% of the PhD graduates are employed in the post-secondary education sector. 26% as tenure track professors with an additional 3% as adjunct professors and 2% as full-time teaching stream professors. Over the time period, there's been a near doubling of PhD graduates with the biggest increase in graduation numbers where you might expect them, physical sciences, life sciences, and these graduates increasingly are finding employment in the private and public sectors, providing the, part, the highly qualified personnel needed to drive an innovation economy. And so um, there you go. Our graduates, our graduate students are finding employment outside of what we might have thought was a typical employment path um, not that long ago, and that would be to to become professors and, uh, and work in post-secondary inst institutions, largely universities for this kind of work. So the, um, the demographics are changing and we need to change with them. My fourth recommendation um, is a big one. Um, and this is to form regional multi-sector consortia to plan for labor market needs and strategies to prepare graduates for these needs. Um, and this is one example where I think, especially during the pandemic, um, this is even more necessary than it, than it was. I'm going to give you an example of um, something that I was a, proud to be a partner with in Ottawa. And it's call, it was called Education City. It's still going on now. It was the name we coined for this project. All four presidents in, um, in post-secondary in Ottawa, so that would be the University of Ottawa, Carleton, Algonquin College, and La Cité, which is a small French college in, um, in Ottawa with a full suite of programming. All four presidents made a commitment to Education City in their strategic mandate agreements to the provincial government. And we actually received funding from the government to develop this concept and what we thought would be the success measures. The vision of Education City was to develop a new type of post-secondary education that's flexible, capitalizes on the advantages of both college and university education models, research universities, as well as comprehensive universities and linked to the workplace training and lifelong learning and development needed by our business, industry, social agencies, and most importantly, our students. And Jim Watson, the mayor of Ottawa, who often spoke of this partnership while I was at Algonquin, spoke of it as an attractor of learners, of businesses to Ottawa. Business and industry often told us that the clear messaging that all four institutions were working together to help meet their talent needs now in the future was revolutionary and very much welcomed by them. This is a major undertaking and requires commitment from the executive leaders of all institutions. Key to its success is the recognition that 
all members have strengths and challenging challenges in meeting the needs of the workforce of the future. So when you think about it, um, think about it in your own community and in your own region of what that might look like. All of the universities, all of the colleges, maybe not in a city, maybe in a, in a region, working together, thinking about how programming could be different and how um, interdisciplinary programs could be built that would serve all students and provide our graduates with those employability skills for the future. Um, it requires um, taking down some of those barriers in competition, taking down the barriers of ownership of different types of programming and really looking at a paradigm shift in in um, in education, and I would say, if you if you would take anything away from this presentation today, think about what that would look like in your region and how you might approach social agencies, businesses, for this kind of this kind of um, this kind of programming. You know, um, I'm retired, not very good at it because I've taken on another job, but you know, I've seen a lot of change in post-secondary education over my time, but I've seen a lot of very um, traditional approaches to programming and to approaching um, our partners in the community about what we can do. And I think looking at these from a completely different perspective, while very challenging, is really the way that we're going to meet the needs of the future. And not even that long in the future. I think the pandemic has, uh, accelerated this uh, this need to to move quickly and to make sure that we're um, we're making the changes that we need. You know, um, you can start in your own institution. Um, and I think that's that's important for for universities is to take a look at what would that interdisciplinary work look like in your own institution and then reach out to others to see if you can share best practices, um, form these uh, working groups of, uh, of different post-secondary institutions to see um, what it might look like if you partner. Uh, I think back to my days um, at Mohawk, and this was a long time ago now, where colleges were just starting to get into the degree business. And uh, we knew at Mohawk that we had a partner just down the road, uh, uh, world-renowned research uh, university, and Mohawk had a, 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 a very um, well-known strength in engineering technology and health. So we took a look at where we could partner in, in those areas, first of all with collaborative degrees in nursing, and then with a program um, that was run through engineering called a Bachelor of Technology in, in uh, various fields, that were emerging and so it wasn't quite as traditional and linear as an engineering program. Those programs started off uh, very small and now are first choice programs at uh, McMaster. It required a huge um, investment of time to work with industry to see what, what did those uh, industries need in these graduates and it was really the the beautiful marriage between the theory of an engineering program and the hands-on applied learning of the college. So lots of examples out there, lots of um, more recent ones than that, but it just goes to show the power of these partnerships. So I'm gonna end my, um, my part of this presentation with, and hopefully we've, we've got some questions with uh, a quote in a book that I recommend that everyone read. And it's from Dr. Joseph Owen, who's the president of Northeast University in a book called Robot Proof, Higher Education in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And so Northeastern is a private research university in Boston. And I really think his quote underscores the importance of the work that could come from a look at future proofing research skills. This, I'm going to, I'm going to read this uh, quote to you because it's long. It's from a couple of, um, a couple, it covers a couple of slides, but I, I do think uh, it's one of my favorites. 
Education is not a panacea for humanity's troubles. We cannot educate ourselves out of all of our social and natural predicaments. We can, however, help individuals brace for change and embrace the technological miracles that lie ahead. Perhaps if we educate enough of them, society's weight will shift, making it more equitable, more just, and more sustainable. I believe that when people are given education, they may still be astonished by the changes and mysteries that the future holds, but they will see these as opportunities rather than threats. Such a world, I believe, is possible. It's our job to make it happen. One of the, um, one of the interesting things about this quote is that Northeastern now has a campus in Toronto. And so they're using their innovative um, approach to spread the word into our country as well. So one to watch for sure. So thanks very much for your, um, your attention to this uh, presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Cheryl. And if you're having any problems unmuting yourself, um, you can just raise your hand and I can manually unmute you as well. I'm also happy to share any of my, I've got like two pages in my original report of, of uh, references. So if you wanna read any of these reports in more detail, happy to share. Great. So yeah, and I somebody just mentioned about when your slides are available that they'd love your references. So I can um, I will be posting Cheryl's slides um, in the next few days, and I'm happy to also share the additional references as well. So Cheryl, you have a question uh, from somebody asking. What are your future research questions? Uh, so thanks for that question. Um, so I was commissioned to write this report. I know that um, um, some of the folks that I'm working with are interested in taking a look at these, especially these regional consortia, the approach to a regional consortia and really um, starting to look at the, uh, the efficacy of them. What, what exists across Canada, if any, um, and uh, can we really determine whether or not these are successful? And if they are successful, what makes them successful? What are, what are the terms that make uh, these partnerships successful? Now, we have to take all of that in a grain, with a grain of salt with the pandemic. This was all work, as I said, just before the doors closed. Um, and so, um, there may be opportunities to take a more micro approach to some of these issues. I will say that the Business Higher Education Roundtable that I was uh, fortunate enough to be a part of does some of this research already. They've, if, you, if you take a look at the RBC website, many of their articles are, um, are already posted. It's still alive and well. In fact, Alan Shepard, who's the president at Western, has just become a member of the, bio, the Business uh, Higher Education Roundtable. It's the, um, if you go right on the Royal Bank of Canada web, website, you can find these reports. They're, they're quite well known. Um, their Humans Wanted report is there, but also a follow-up study that they did on future skills is also up there and many more in the last year. So, um, so I think that would, those would be the research questions that I would be interested in. And, and also, um, interested in following the work of different groups as, uh, as the pandemic, post-pandemic evolves.
Great. And do we have any other questions from uh, the attendees? I'm just going to put, um, so somebody's mentioned, uh, mentioning that they've envisioned this need for almost a decade. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, so I was in post-secondary education for uh, almost four decades. Um, and sometimes we need uh, a bit of a shakeup to make these things happen. And, um, and I think there's a lot of bad things about the pandemic, and I certainly don't want to uh, trivialize the pandemic at all. But I think um, I think we should use this as an, as an opportunity to to work differently and to do things differently. Um, we all we've seen it in healthcare. Um, we've seen the silos break down in healthcare over the pandemic, and and uh, and we've certainly seen different areas work together much more quickly. Um, and much, much more effectively than we have in the past. That needs to happen in post-secondary education. Um, and the sooner the better, but it requires all of us to have a change in our mindset. All of us to question the, um, the traditions, the, uh, the conceptions of uh, post-secondary education that we've had. And, um, and that's not easy. It's very challenging, but it's important. And other... Um, other institutions will do it for us if we don't. There's a, a large cadre of private institutions, both in the States and certainly coming into Canada. And um, I believe strongly in public education. I believe strongly in liberal arts. And I think we need to um, make sure that uh, we really have a sense of urgency to make this, this happen in the next two to five years for sure. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. And I just, um, I just put a little, you're getting a lot of um, agreement in your chat box about your comments. Um, and, uh, and I also just wanted to say, I just put in the chat box, just a link to an evaluation form. So if you wouldn't mind taking it, it should probably take you about two minutes after this event, just to click on the, the link, um, just to let us know what you thought of, of today's talk. I know um, I, I thought reading Cheryl's report was so interesting. I think it's something that, that um, you know, we would, we, we know is important and it's even greater to see that she's done, you know, the research and, and to put it on paper and hopefully, you know, change can happen in, in these research intensive universities to follow suit. So, so thank you, Cheryl, so much for your time. I know you, you've got a few other things on the go. So thank you for, for taking the time to, to chat with us today. Um, and like I said, I'll be, I'll be posting everything on the Research Impact Canada website, but feel free to email uh, myself afterwards if you have any questions and I can always direct them to Cheryl or, or answer you um, to the best of my abilities. Thanks for having me, Julia. Bye everyone. Bye.